So what if we could have a conversation about COVID-19 that didn't end up in hurt feelings and misinformation? Wouldn't that be nice just to have a grown-up discussion about what's going on? Well, good, because that's what we're going to do. We're going to have a conversation today about what the current status is and get our questions answered so we can know about how we can reopen our business and engage our customers and serve our clients. Today's show is going to be exactly what you need to know from the person who does know. Our guest, we're welcoming back Dr. John Raymond, CEO of the Medical College of Wisconsin, to answer our questions on the virus, the vaccine, and so much more. This is Small Business Rally Point, the official weekly meeting of small business owners everywhere. I'm your host, Pat Miller, the Idea Coach. It's really great to have you back. So today's show, as always, is sponsored by Bank 59, Quick Trip, Serendipity Labs, and the Idea Collective Collaboration Community for Small Business Owners. Now, this show is interactive, as we say every week, and especially with a topic this important. If you have questions, put them into the chat. But we also welcome your comments and sarcastic remarks, because that's what makes the show fun. So get them in there. And we will get your questions in with Dr. Raymond and make sure you hang out for the quick trip after party networking so we can say hello and get to know one another and we can all be friends. So without any further ado, I'm so excited to welcome back Dr. John Raymond, CEO of the Medical College of Wisconsin. Dr. Raymond, it's great to see you, my friend. How you been? I've been great. And it's uh, really an honor to be back here with you, Pat, and with all the small business owners. It's great to have you. And I got to tell you, it's nice to have someone uh, with your knowledge and uh, just accurate information to come in and tell us exactly what's going on, because it's sometimes hard to get what we need to know. So today, let's start with the big picture. Just where are we with COVID-19 with Wisconsin? Are things looking good? Things are looking good. Um, I guess, though, I um, want to make sure we start off with probably we're never going to eradicate COVID-19, so we're going to need to learn how to live with it. But we're, we're really doing incredibly well right now. Um, the vaccines, the three that we have on the market in the U.S., have been absolute game changers for us. It's really quite remarkable where we are. Um, so maybe I could just start with, uh, with some of the indicators. In Wisconsin, our seven-day average of daily new cases is down to 329 uh, per day. And that's as low as we've seen since this time last year, so 11 or 12 months. Hospitalizations also are trending downward. And ICU admissions are stable, maybe trending downward a little bit. It was really interesting. We're at about 80 per day. But that's only 20% of the people in intensive care units that we were experiencing at the beginning of December. So clearly we're trending in the right direction. So what is the current status then about deaths? And are we getting better at treating people that have the severe infection? Is that just because are we learning and doing a better job of treating people that are severely infected? Yeah, thanks, Pat. Um, deaths are averaging about five per day, obviously five more than we want. Um, and that's down from a peak of about 60 deaths per day that we were seeing right at the end of November and the beginning of December, then that's here in Wisconsin. In terms of treatment, yes, I think we're constantly learning more about the disease. Um, but, you know, we haven't had a game-changing new medication that's really uh, been transformative for us. We've learned a lot about supportive care, how to identify patients at risk early, and to provide them the best kind of supportive care, which we really didn't know that much about, say, maybe a year or 15 months ago when the pandemic first came to Wisconsin. When you look at other diseases that have been exposed around the country and around the world, are you surprised that there hasn't been a breakthrough medication or a treatment plan that really has changed the way that we're treating people? I mean, you mentioned some of the tactics that we're using to make people more comfortable and help them while they're infected, but it doesn't sound like there was a discovery of treatment. Am I hearing you say that correctly? Is that surprising? You know, it, it actually, in one way, it's surprising. In another way, it isn't. So coronaviruses have been around a long time. They, com they cause the common cold are similar to common cold, but we've never really been able to treat them. And there's been a pretty significant effort devoted to veterinary medicine and animal husbandry where coronaviruses can cause significant problems. And we're only 15 months into this new virus. So from that perspective, it's not a surprise that we couldn't have a game-changing new medication. On the other hand, we've deployed enormous resources 
to try to find something that worked. And as it turns out, the one medication that seems to be the best is an old and expensive medicine called dexamethasone that's been around a long time. It's a steroid. And that's probably the best that we have. You know, convalescent plasma worked a little bit in, in some populations. Remdesivir helped a little bit. Um, some of the other anti-inflammatory medications worked in a small population of young people that might have an overly vigorous immune response. But really for us, vaccination has been our ticket to the other side of the pandemic. And you mentioned three vaccines that are out in the community and we're vaccinating as quickly as possible. Can you give us an update on how vaccinations look in Wisconsin? Um, Yeah, we're doing quite well here in Wisconsin. Five million doses have been administered. Um, 47% of adults have received at least one dose and 41% have completed their course. And that's not that different than what we're seeing across the U.S. 164 million vaccinated doses with 131 million completing their course. Um, And we know in the U.S. 61% of adults have had at least one dose. And that's, um, we're on track to meet President Biden's goal of having 70% of eligible adults vaccinated by July 4th. Although we're slowing down uh, here in Wisconsin, we're down to uh, about 20,000 doses per day. Uh, That's less than half of what we were doing at our our peak. And in uh, the US, we're down to 1.8 million doses per day. And that's down from a peak of about 3.4 million that we saw on April 13th. So we're really dealing now with a population of people that either simply aren't gonna get vaccinated under any circumstances, or they have questions that they need to have answered, or maybe they're in parts of the community that are difficult to reach. And I would say uh, not just, we we talk a lot about urban communities and people of color uh, that may be um, essential frontline healthcare workers that don't have the flexibility to maybe go to a vaccination center, but also in rural counties of America, there's been some some difficulty getting the vaccines out to people that may be working on farms and other rural settings in which they just can't take time off to get the vaccines. So I think getting up to 70% is gonna be a bit of a challenge because the folks that really wanted to get vaccinated and had the flexibility to do that have largely been vaccinated already. We're talking with Dr. John Raymond, CEO, Medical College of Wisconsin, and uh, you're pretty much the one person that could answer this question. So I'm just going to take the chance to ask it. Forty-one uh, percent is not seventy percent, but we're on our way, doing our best to get there. But what is the impact on the medical community of having forty-one percent of the community vaccinated? I mean, that's a start. And what's the impact on the system knowing that forty-one percent are as protected as they can be? Well, I think like everybody else, we're optimistic and we're very hopeful. Um, One of the things that I think really is truly astounding, and I'm I'm not sure we all appreciate it, is these vaccines were um, developed in record time, about one-tenth of the time that it normally takes to develop a vaccine. And they have a very, very favorable safety profile. And they're more effective than we ever could have hoped for, quite honestly to have 90 plus percent efficacy at preventing symptomatic infections, hospitalizations and death is almost unprecedented for any vaccine. And to have them developed so rapidly is is almost a miracle. Um, So we're we're all feeling good. I know that the number, the percent of 70 to 80% has been talked about a lot for achieving herd immunity in the US. But it's interesting, once Israel reached about 50% Uh, fully vaccinated population, they had a very uh, steep decline in the number of cases. So every every vaccination that we do gets us just a little bit closer to the finish line. We're in pretty good shape. Uh, What I want to make sure everybody knows though, Pat, is we need more people to be vaccinated if we want to get back to a new normal that's a lot like the old normal. Um, it, It isn't socially responsible and it's probably not a good personal choice for people to say, Eh, well, the cases are going down, hospitalizations are going down. I haven't been vaccinated yet, so maybe I won't be vaccinated. We really need everybody to pitch in. I think one of the things that happens when you get vaccinated, because I've been fortunate enough to be vaccinated, is you kind of come back out of your shell a little bit, and then you have to adapt to society again. I'm leaving my house. I'm going to a restaurant. I'm going to the coffee shop. I'm I'm going out and re-entering society. And something that 
I, I mean, I'd like to think I understand this, but again, I don't know. So I'll ask you if the vaccine is 90 plus percent effective and I leave my house, that doesn't mean I have a 90% chance of being affected. That means if I'm exposed to the vaccine, I have a 90% chance of being defended against it, right? So it's not just leaving your house 90%. It's if you run into the actual vaccine, you still have a 90% chance of being defended from the vaccine. Am I thinking about that the right way? Yeah, I think you are. I mean, 90% may actually underestimate the, the protection you get from, from the virus. Hmm. So the vaccines... Basically, there's a couple of variables we don't talk about much. One is burden of disease in the community. If there's a lot of people that are infected with COVID-19, your risk is going to go up, even if you have been vaccinated, because you're going to be exposed to more people, and maybe they're going to have, uh, they'll be shedding more virus because they may be sick. So that's a variable we don't talk about. And one thing that we, we do need to think about is uh, most of the counties in Wisconsin still have what's considered to be a high burden of disease, even though the case counts are going down. Um, so, you know, that's that's a factor. But still, if you're exposed um, and you get infected, we also know that the likelihood that you're going to get sick goes way down. So those vaccines work beautifully. And that's something, if you could elaborate on just a little bit, the people that have, is it called a breakthrough infection when they're vaccinated and they get it anyway, that the severity goes way down? Can you talk about that for a second? It does. There have been about 10,000 cases in the U.S. of people who have been fully vaccinated. They're two weeks out from their second dose of the Moderna or Pfizer vaccine or two weeks out from the uh, single dose of Johnson & Johnson vaccine who have been infected with COVID-19. That's actually probably an underestimate because we know that many people that get reinfected or get infected after being vaccinated have pretty mild disease. And so they may not even go get tested. But having said that, if you get sick, you're not gonna get as sick as you would have without being vaccinated. But there are still people that have, require hospitalization. And unfortunately, there are people who have died with a breakthrough infection. So we're really talking about risk reduction or risk mitigation. We're not talking about completely eliminating the risk of having a severe outcome from COVID-19. So the vaccines are great, yeah. but they don't take your risk down to zero. Oh, I appreciate the uh, clarity on that. I want to ask you about the CDC mask mandate ruling in just one second, but we have a question uh, from one of the folks in the crowd. Uh, Tom wants to know, with 41% vaccinated, what are the demographics of the remaining 59%? Are many of them in the population groups that are least vulnerable and might be why we are approaching herd immunity, even though we're fewer than 78% vaccinated? Yeah, I think there are a couple of really good observations there. First of all, Age is the most important factor in having bad outcomes from COVID-19. So the fact that we um, have over 90% of nursing home residents in the U.S. who've been vaccinated and over 70% of people that are over the age of 65 who've been vaccinated is a game changer for us. So um, yes, uh, I think that most vulnerable people have largely been vaccinated. But people with pre-existing conditions, uh, many have not yet been vaccinated, and that, that is a factor. The, the other variable here is these new variants of concern, which are um, strains of the virus that have mutated, seem to, be, uh, seem to like younger people more than maybe the older wild-type virus did. That may be because they just simply don't have older, more susceptible people to infect. But we, we can't assume that we always know everything that we need to know about COVID-19 because it's a shape-shifting virus. Um, and people under the age of 50 still get sick. And in fact, most of the new cases are in the age range of 10 to 29. And kids also are becoming sicker than they were earlier in the pandemic and requiring hospitalization. And, and a few have actually died. So let's talk about the CDC ruling about the mask mandate. Uh, can you tell us from a medical perspective, what was the criteria that they used? What was the trigger that made them say, you know what, it's okay if you're vaccinated, you no longer to wear, need to wear a mask? Yeah, like a lot of things with COVID-19, I don't think there was a single study or a single light bulb moment. Um, between February and early May, there was an accumulation of evidence that really um, was promising for us. So we 
clearly saw that when lots of people were vaccinated, the reduction that we got in severe illness, hospitalization, and death that we saw in the phase two and three clinical trials of 30,000 people was something that was as good or better when you were vaccinating millions and millions of people. And you don't always see that when you have a small number of people that, that are in vaccine trials. So that was promising news. There also was clear evidence that people who had been vaccinated were less likely to spread COVID-19 to other people through incidental contact. And although we thought that was likely to happen, there really wasn't good experimental proof of that. So as we were vaccinating millions, tens of millions, and now over 100 million people, that became clearer and clearer. And I think probably the most important variable that led to this relaxation of these mitigation measures was a growing confidence that the um, immunization or the vaccination with these three new vaccines was pretty durable so that it wasn't something that would just last a month or two, uh, that it's likely that we'll get six or 12 months or maybe even more of good protection. And the three vaccines also appear to be effective against some of these variants of concern that have emerged. So the UK strain, the strain from Brazil, the strain from South Africa, and the three emerging strains from India, which are of particular concern, are three vaccines that are approved through emergency use authorization in the US appear to give you pretty good protection from all those new variants. So I think it was the, the weight of those new findings that, that came out over the last few months that led the, uh, the, the CDC to make the recommendation. Also just the understanding that people wanted some hope, uh, that there was a lot of fatigue, there was a, a lot of um, fractious arguments about masking and leading to conflicts, and they wanted to give us a little bit of hope. Now, having said that, I, I think that they could have softened the ground a little bit for us. Um, this, this did seem to be sudden, and employers uh, and businesses and, quite honestly, healthcare providers were really scrambling to get good information and to be able to explain and then have good policy decisions uh, for, you know, for their workplaces as well. And I think we're still catching up. And on that point, you know, I saw it from the outside, just non-doctors and just people that I know and I talk to. What was the observation like with the doctors and your teams inside your community and your uh, social circle? How did doctors and immunologists and the experts react to the mask mandate falling? Yeah, there, there was a whole range of different reactions. Um, there are many, many people who believe that um, not only what, what was the guidance perhaps a little premature, but the CDC guidance wasn't specific enough. I think some people just heard you don't need to wear a mask anymore uh, without realizing this is for vaccinated people in small groups outdoors, uh, and it did not apply to healthcare settings. On the other hand, um, we at the Medical College of Wisconsin have vaccination rates for our learners and our employees that are approaching 90% now. Um, which is actually better than the typical healthcare system, which is in the in the mid 60%. And so there's a fairly strong push for us to liberalize our internal congregations and, and masking guidelines. And we're still going through a process where we're trying to decide how, how quickly we're going to start to relax those mitigation measures. This is a great opportunity for us. We get to talk with Dr. John Raymond from the Medical College of Wisconsin. So if you have questions that I haven't addressed yet, put them in the chat. We'll get them in here, but we only have a few moments left. I want to ask about people that are still wearing their masks, even though they're vaccinated. It's a personal choice. I don't have a problem with it, but from a medical perspective, I mean, can you talk about that? Is it necessary to still wear masks if you're fully vaccinated? I know that seems a little bit redundant, seeing how we just talked about the mask mandate, but I'm talking specifically about the people that have the vaccine, but just feel more comfortable if they continue to wear their mask? First of all, if people want to wear a mask, that's perfectly okay. And in fact, in Asia, after the um, SARS-CoV-1 uh, scare that they had, it became very acceptable to wear masks, especially during flu season. And we know that there's been, was almost no flu last year because of masking and hand washing and social distancing. And interestingly, some of the GI viruses that circulate in kids also were virtually extinguished. There was, there was virtually no transmission. So there may be people that decide that they don't wanna get the flu and they're, they're gonna do that. They may not wanna shake hands. And I don't think that we should marginalize people for making that personal choice. 
the other thing is, again, half of our population has not been vaccinated. Um, we know that this is a, a deadly disease and that the CDC guidance really was for outdoor settings with low risk of high, high proximity congregation or small groups of vaccinated people. They didn't say that you could tear your mask off and go do anything that you wanted to. And again, it's just a matter of how comfortable you are with that 90% efficacy of the vaccine for your own personal risk reduction and how responsible you feel to people around you. That's great. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, we've got a question from Russ. Since the virus will likely be with us into the future, as you mentioned, do you anticipate the need for an annual booster shot? What, is, what does it look like there? Yeah, thank you, Russ. Great question. And it's one that's being debated right now. And, you know, you, we're just going to have to look into our crystal ball. Um, these vaccines work beautifully, that um, the immunity that we get seems to be pretty durable. But um, I would I would lean on the side of saying we're probably going to need an annual booster. Um, one reason may be that our immunity will become less significant over time. And we see that with many other vaccines. The other variable is if the, vac if the virus continues to mutate, it may reach a point where the antibodies that we generate and the T cells that are our memory cells for immunity um, may not recognize the spike protein, which is what we have been making most of the vaccines from um, very effectively. And you might just need a specific booster, but we won't, we really won't know that probably um, until we get into the fall. Okay. How are your medical teams doing? I know that at one point it was really red line. It was all hands on deck and you were trying to keep up. But now that things have slowed down a little bit, how are the medical, medical teams doing? Are they recovering at all? Have they had a chance to rest? Um, good question. I think it depends on the people. And we were blessed in Wisconsin to never have a surge that completely overwhelmed our health systems. We came awfully close at the end of November when many healthcare workers were sick or were in quarantine and all of our hospitals were full. Um, so we're probably doing better than many other communities, but 15 months of worrying about the virus, uh, worrying about exposing your family and your loved ones uh, from maybe an incidental contact in the healthcare setting, having to wear personal protective equipment in and out of each and every room, um, it, it has taken a toll on, on all of us. And you know, physicians and other healthcare providers um, feel burnt out and in many ways now misunderstood and perhaps underappreciated because of a lot of the misinformation and disinformation that have been spreading on social media and in part through mainstream media also, and the politicization of some of the simple mitigation measures for COVID-19. You know, we're, we're humans and we've all been caught up in that as well. We've always enjoyed your outlook because you've just given it to us straight. Like, I love talking to you about this. Uh, and hopefully we'll get to talk to you in the future, but not necessarily about this. Where are you distributing information? How can we stay in touch with what you have to say so we can hear it directly from you? We, you know, my media appearances have gone down as the pandemic has um, taken a good turn, which is really good news. Um, but we do have um, COVID-19 updates on the Medical College of Wisconsin website, www.edu slash COVID-19. And we try to update those several times a week. That's great. That's great. Okay, so last question. Uh, do you have a final message? I mean, we're all small business owners here. We're hoping to get back to normal in our fight against COVID-19 and really try and enjoy the summer and get our businesses on track. I mean, any final thoughts about where the virus and the vaccine are taking us? Well, I think we're going to a good place um, and it's going to even get better as the summer goes on. We do need to be careful because we're not sure what's going to happen in the fall as people, as weather gets cold and people go more indoors. But, uh, you know, I would, I would just encourage people to be vaccinated, um, and listen to your employees and your customers just in terms of how comfortable they are with mass mitigation and other mitigation strategies in your particular setting. Well, it's always a pleasure to talk with you, Dr. Raymond. I, I just am so grateful for the time you've given us today. You've answered a lot of our questions and it's always great catching up with you. Thank you to you and your team for everything you've done for the community and thanks for coming on today. Thanks, Pat. An honor to be here. Right, it's my pleasure. Uh, Dr. John Raymond, Medical College of Wisconsin. It's always great to get a chance to catch up with him. Uh, and now let's move on with the rest of the show. So we've got more to do. So here's what's going on. We're going to welcome in, against my better judgment, 
Andy Wines. And uh, Ann Rakowicki is here with some good news as well. She's got a great fundraiser she'll share in just one moment. Uh, but before we get to that, I want to remind you, night school is happening tomorrow night. Night school for small business owners. We're going to bring in Ann Knutson, who's the Senior Vice President of HR for Bank 59. She's also a college professor that teaches negotiation for a living. So if you want to learn how to make better deals with your customers, negotiate better leases, drive down the hard cost of the stuff you have to buy, Ann Knutson is literally going to teach us how to be a better negotiator. Now, tickets are on sale, but Idea Collective members get in free. So if you are an Idea Collective member, you're in like Flynn, and we're giving Idea Collective members a couple of extra tickets for their clients and colleagues. So if you don't have a ticket, find an Idea Collective member like maybe JB or Susie or Tom or other people that are on the call. They've got some freebies. Just connect with them. All right. So Ann Rakowicki, it's great to see you, my friend. You're from the Marketing Kitchen, of course. You've got a really cool event. Can you come on and tell us about it? Okay, here we go. <laughs> there you, you are. Now? Hello, All dear. Right. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing good. Tell us about your event. Well, thanks for having me here. Love you. Love your show. Thanks for having me. <laughs> um, I've been working with a group uh, called the Hometown Foundation. They're based out of Washington County. And what I love about the Hometown Foundation is they combine um, music as their primary source of fundraising. And really, they exist so that they can give smaller groups that can't throw events like concerts and, you know, sing-alongs and you name it, they distribute money to other groups in Washington County. So it's a really cool concept. The brainchild is, uh, is it's the brainchild of a guy named Mike Christian, uh, who's become a good friend. And the big thing that we have happening this summer is we've got three major events. Uh, one is we've got our Homegrown Music Festival, which is back for year six in July. Uh, we've got the Summer Sounds at Sandy Knoll Park. Uh, we've got four of those this summer. But the big thing that we're doing this year is a weekly concert series that starts next week at Regner Park in West Bend. Our first artist is uh, Evan Christian, a, a jazz guitar player, and Betsy Aid and the Well-Known Strangers. A really big push that we have, though, is our June 17th show. We partnered with Guitars for Bets and Patrick Nettesheim, who's the founder of that wonderful organization. Uh, we're doing a couple of things. There's a few ways that people can help. Is one that they can just tell everybody that they know about the event. Um, we're collecting guitars on June 12th, uh, June 12th at the Bend Theater. They've been a great partner. We're gonna collect shows, uh, guitars that night at the show, uh, Karma Shotgun, which is Patrick Nettesheim's band is playing. Johnny T-Bird also playing. We'll collect guitars the 12th and the 17th. The way people can really help us make a huge impact for Guitars for Vets is by donating. And West Bend Mutual Insurance has come up huge for us. They are matching donations in any amount up to $5,000. So really we're hoping to present a $10,000 check to Patrick Nenesheim and Guitars for Vets. Uh, we're about, I think just, I got a notification, we're at about $2,000 collectively between our donors and what West Bend Mutual Insurance is kicking in. Um, it, it's a great cause. If you're familiar at all with Guitars for Vets or not, uh, it was founded by Patrick Nettesheim probably over a decade ago. He was teaching a, a gentleman who was a veteran, he was teaching him guitar lessons and together they learned that it was a really great coping skill for, for veterans and it's blossomed, it's across the country. Now it's not only in Milwaukee, it's in Biloxi, Mississippi, it's in Canada and all of the guitars, everything, it's a self-sustaining program. So people donate guitars, um, veterans who enroll in the program have to pass a 10 week class before they get all their gear. Uh, so there's guitars that are purchased, there's guitars that are donated. So if you got one that does nothing but collect dust, you can bring it in. Contact me. I'll come and pick it up from you. You don't have to drive all the way out to West Bend. But the only way we can get these matching funds from West Bend Mutual Insurance up to $5,000 is if you donate directly to the Hometown Foundation through our donation portal. And that money will be earmarked absolutely for Guitars for Vets. That sounds great. Do we have a link that we can put into the chat? 
I'm doing it right now. I've got to put my glasses back on. Here. I know, right? <laughs> Tell me about it. All right. Well, good luck with all of the events and the concerts and Guitars for Vets is a terrific organization. We'll do what we can to support you. And thanks for coming on today. We appreciate Thank it. Thank you so much. All right. Speaking of vets, look who just showed up. Andy Wines from the Young Guns organization. Hello, my friend. You have a big event this week. How are you? Well, yeah, I'm doing well. Yeah. Young Guns Spring Summit back in person, shaking hands, kissing babies. Thursday, 8.30 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. And we're sold out. So I appreciate the airtime. I love airtime. God only knows, you know, not only do I love the camera, but more importantly, the camera loves me. Yeah, so I do appreciate yeah, the yeah. opportunity. I know, I don't know. It's been great. It's that. been great. That, you know, as, as much as uh, all the things you do, I do, I do collab, I will be there tomorrow night uh, at the, uh, the night school. I'm a terrible negotiator. I'm even worse in HR. So, you know, there's a lot, a lot, of, a lot of learning opportunity for me tomorrow. Uh, but no, Young Guns made a bet. So we still have virtual option available. So you're still alive. You're still networking. You'll be networking with other people that are uh, attending virtually. So that's awesome. And we're going to be checking out the new Bookville Conference Center as a group. It's, uh, they just got, you know, they, they started last year before things got started. So it'll be a great opportunity to see the space and get back to seeing each other in person. So we're really excited um, that we sold out um, over 100 attendees. We're going to fill the room. Uh, we're going to learn a lot. And it's all about, the event is all about building your fire, which is sales, building the sales fire that you have, and then how to fan the flame. So for all of us that have been sitting on and waiting and building our operations, we're reevaluating our marketing in the last 15 months. Now it's time to go out and sell. And that's what the entire event is geared towards. Um, kicked off by Michael Rampola, fellow uh, Idea Club uh, member. Then we have a panel featuring Paul Newberger, And then finally, uh, a, a guest speaker, always, to our keynote speaker, I should say, talking about how to build, once you have the fire built, how to, as a business owner, put the energy behind it to blow up your fire and do all the wonderful things. So thank you for all those Idea Collective members that have come on and have supported Young Guns in the past and bought tickets. I'm looking forward to seeing all your smiling faces in person this Thursday. Yeah, it's going to be great to get back together in person. And it's just perfect for the Young Guns organization, breaking the rules of business to be the first or one of the first big organizations to get together in person. And I think the sellout of in-person tickets speaks to that, how desperate people are and how much we want to get back together. Although I wouldn't be doing the kissing babies part. That's probably, I don't think Dr. Just Raymond would approve of that. No. Just don't bring your baby. You know, you don't bring your baby. We have no problems. <laughs> All right, Andy. Thanks a lot. Good luck at the event. I'll see you Thursday. All right. Thanks, so man. here's what we got. We've got a great uh, contest going on as well. Our summer kickoff contest is here because Memorial Day weekend kicks off the long, warm, hello, summer season. We're giving away a $50 gift card from Quick Trip and a $50 gift card from Home Depot. So you can pick up a cooler and some ice cold beer if you want or whatever you'd like to use the gift card for. It's super easy to enter. Just get to the link that's on the screen before June 7th and put your name in the virtual box and you'll have a chance to win. One more announcement. If you're not a member of the Idea Collective community yet, we're still working with Bank59. Love those guys. Thanks to their generous support, we're still giving away one-year memberships into the Idea Collective community. Just do your banking with them. Hit bank59.com slash idea collective and you'll have a chance to win. All right. I said there was only one more announcement, but I lied. The Pat Miller Show is on the air, and we're always looking for guests for our new program. So here's the deal. I've had somebody ask me, why am I doing this show called The Pat Miller Show? And the way that I figure, it's a chance for us to take our idea collective message to everyone. It's a one-hour show where I interview uh, small business owners, and we grow, fix, or celebrate. You need a question you want me to collaborate with you on. You had a big win in your business. You want to come on and tell people about it and share how you had that big win. It's all about collaborating and supporting small business owners on their journey. And I record it on Tuesdays at one o'clock. And if you want to come on the show, hit the link that's on the screen. Thank you, JB. You're the best. And you can pick a time and a day that works for you and come onto the show and we will interview you and feature your business. It's patmillershow.com. And I'm planning to go big with this thing. So fingers crossed and your early support uh, it really means a lot. And even if you can't come on, if you listen to it and shoot me some feedback, I'd really appreciate it. All right, so let's wrap up the show. Thank you, Dr. Raymond. You are the best. And Rickowicki and AFW, thank you all for coming on today. JB, of course, producing the show, the ultimate connector of my business, BFF. Thank you to our sponsors, Bank59, Serendipity Labs, and Quick Trip. And let's hang out and do the Quick Trip after party for networking and connection. I'm Pat Miller, the Idea Coach, founder and host of the Idea Collective. Thanks for coming to Small Business Rally Point. I'll see you next time.